Yeah, we're gonna go live now. Uh, we're gonna talk about that like later, Eric. But I've, we've we've done some Q and A's with some Techco people and OCAC people at conventions before, uh -huh. and it's kind of like hard for people to um, be very interested in some of the things they talk about. I guess because very like economic stuff. It's like pretty um, dry sometimes. I guess. Not oh, interesting. Okay. okay. Nice. Yeah, uh, can you give you, us a link? You put the cross post and the description and everything. You guys got it. Oh, I got it. All right, man. You guys got this presentation. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, and the presentation. Uh, yes, Ben, that is the correct link. Hey, Ben, can you move the can you move the OFT logo closer to the middle so it's like next to the top logo? I don't uh, know if this not making any sounds. My computer's having a meltdown. One second. Um, ben, I think you shared the uh, the producer link versus like the actual live link. I think that's like the link that you see like from um, the creator. Uh, I, I, uh, I, got, I, got, I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, thank you. This is the one from OFT anyways. I think that's the one. I mean, if you go on like the top SD or OFT page, you're, you're going to see it. So, yeah. Oh, okay. We're live now. Yeah. Um, just make sure the sounds are muted right now, too, because it'll be live immediately. So, yeah. So, let's mute. You guys want to mute? Sure. Uh, I will mute. I thought, we're gonna, I thought we're going to talk to the to the group and see who, who, who's on. We are going to talk to the group. I'm talking about the other two. <laughs> Oh, I've already. Oh, I oh, yeah, the other two. That's true. <laughs> I mean, I can talk a lot, but <laughs> yeah, well, I'm gonna post these around, share them out a bit. Yeah. Um. Someone make sure that it gets on the the event page too. One of you, Eric. I think I'm doing that now. Yeah. Go. Okay. All right, I guess we're live now. Oh. This is the first time you're like doing like Facebook Live kind of thing, right? That's right. Oh. This is the first time for me. <laughs> Exciting. Shoot, I almost posted uh, the, um, the Google link versus the, uh, the Facebook link. Okay, gotcha. Double check that. Um, yeah, let's that It's always really hard for me to find your like. I'm trying to tag tap SD, and I can never find tap SD. It's just very long. It's the San Diego part. It's like yeah, but long. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to find it. It it like it doesn't show. Like I'm. Is the um, link I just posted on the Facebook? Uh, hello. Um, I'm yep. Yes. That's right. This is the first time for me. <laughs> Shoot, I almost posted uh, the uh, Google versus the uh, Facebook link. All right. We got a few more minutes left. Is anybody in the chat? Can you see? Yes. I actually cannot see it right now. It's not really showing up for me. Eric, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, do you see anybody in the chat? Um, I am going to go to the chat. 
I'm currently watching it on just like the live link, but oh, we have somebody, Ann Chen. Cool, welcome. <laughs> hey. Um, hey, where are you guys yeah. from? Yeah, so uh, we're gonna uh, go ahead. We're gonna start about ten minutes, just letting everyone know. So hang around a little bit. Um, oh man, I should really ask Ben to just play on some. Oh no, background music, you get copyrighted. That's how half like ten minute of my ten minutes of my one of the, my live streams got cut off. Yes, so we're just going to fill in the silence with with some some um, chit chat. Oh, yeah. Are you guys doing uh, the? Are you guys doing the? Are you guys doing the mental uh, the mental health thing every every weekend? Yes. So there will be a mental health um, event. It's um, on Saturday morning at eleven. So the the first one was yesterday. There'll be one uh, next Saturday, and then another one the Saturday after that. So they all have slightly different topics. What was the last one about? So about, um, I think it was just like stress management and kind of like how to maintain your own mental health during like being stuck at home and everything. Mm -hmm. And we had, there were a few like mental health experts that were like panelists and they're giving you kind of um, different, different, you know, tips to how to like manage it and um you know, the different resources, I guess, that are out there. Nice. I think yeah, Evelyn is one of the hosts of it. So she is um, talking about it, which is great. Tap Ella in the house. Yeah, so I'm in San Diego and I guess Eric is in Boston. Yep, I'm in Boston. I think I think it's been interesting just working off of two coasts, <laughs> doing a lot of our meetings and everything. But it's um... yeah, yeah. I mean that three hour difference. It doesn't seem like a lot, but like sometimes it makes it difficult when it's like you know late at night or like overlapping with the work day. Yeah, I think one of the meetings ran like three hours. Like I think the last last meeting ran like three hours, and I was like, and he, and like, oh, you guys like you guys can, like I don't know, watch a movie afterwards, and I was like, it's midnight here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right yeah talking about like yeah. mental health and during COVID-19 actually I was, I was listening to a all right so yesterday I went to Chinatown to get some uh, food supplies and then uh, just fun fact on the way back a farmer's market was setting up near my apartment uh -huh. I was like, god <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I was so upset. But um, apart from that, I, I was listening to a podcast when I was going there, and I saw that um, I, uh, I was listening to NPR has this podcast called Hidden Hidden Brain, Hidden Mind, or Hidden Brain, Hidden Mind, I think. And it was talking about, um, I think it's called social perception or something like that. And it's talking about just how the attorney general, the former attorney general actually was talking about how loneliness is probably one of the biggest causes for a lot of problems in the States. And, you know, obviously with COVID-19, it's it's even bigger case. And I thought, I just thought it was really interesting. And they were talking about how like, you know, um, you know, obviously with loneliness, it sometimes comes with, you know, obesity, it comes with, you know, which would lead to diabetes, uh, a lot of mental health issues. And I thought, it was, I thought it was really interesting. They were saying like, the term of social distancing is not very good because we don't want you to distance yourself socially. I, we want you guys to <laughs> distance yourselves physically, uh, right. but so, socially still be still be with people. Well, that was really important. Right, exactly. So I agree. It's just like that's just the term that people came up with, and it's stuck now. So it's pretty hard to like replace it with a with a better term. But physical it probably is something more like um, you know physical distancing or like. Um, I don't know. I don't know what a better term would be, but I agree. It's like really difficult right now for a lot of people. Like I saw some different like memes or different posts about how like right now all the introverts are like really happy because they actually get to 
have time to themselves and not interact with people. And all the extroverts are just like, you know, going through, like, uh, <laughs> going through breakdowns or just like not able to get all the interaction that they usually get. So. <laughs> yeah. I think um I think I think it's I think it's really interesting and like and I think the there's a couple of memes going around of like programmers like work from home uh, work from home is the same thing for programmers before work from home after work home same thing <laughs> right uh, like gamers are probably the the happiest right now because they're like oh great I never left anyways <laughs> <laughs> yeah no gamers and Twitch and all the different streaming platforms are doing really well right now it's doing so well right now. <laughs> Yeah. I think uh, so. I, I, was, I was trying to host the. I was doing hosting the the movie night yesterday, and like Discord just keeps still keeps having problems. And I was like, I'm not gonna lie, they're having a problem that they probably didn't think was gonna happen. They're like, there's too much traffic. Streams can't be set up properly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, welcome, Franklin. Tapo C in the house too. Yeah, Tapo C. Yeah. We're gonna get started probably around five, so we got a few more minutes to go. <sighs> have you been watching any any good streams recently <laughs> streams wise no but there has been going completely off topic but i play i play league of legends and there's been a large um, shift in the esports scene so there's, there's <laughs> the, uh one one guy left like a team and went back to his old team is like yeah i think it's i don't know I've, I've always i've always thought esports was always a fun thing too it was like um i remember when it first got started you know everyone was ridiculing it and i think some people still are actually but yeah. it's like if you watch a production it's like it's intense and i'm not gonna lie esports people are like like jokes on you guys <laughs> like you know we're still having our events just this i mean not exactly the same but it's 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 doing pretty well that was interesting yeah, yeah. Esports stuff is really interesting. There's like so much money in some of like League and in StarCraft. Like there it's crazy how much how big it is, especially in like South Korea. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just like it's very big. It's like at the level of like major professional sports <laughs> in those yeah. places. Yeah. Speaking of professional sports, uh, only baseball league that's playing in the world is Taiwan right now. <laughs> it's not that, not that article. Yeah. And um, they're saying they need English broadcasters. So if you're interested <laughs> in broadcasting in English or like, you know, being an announcer, then you can contact the Taiwanese Baseball League. <laughs> hey, I was, I was watching that there's a bunch of like sportscasters that are getting really bored. So they started like um, sportscasting like their dogs or like their, their, like their kids interacting, whatever. So I think they should just, you know, like go over to Taiwanese Baseball. It's, you know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. All the, I think they're talking about potentially having baseball happen, but just only in like one or two like spring training locations and just having uh, all the teams being there and play with no audience members or anything. I don't right. know if that actually happened, but I saw an article about that maybe being something they were going to try to do. Uh, it could be interesting. I think um I think uh, I think the NFL draft just happened a couple uh, like a couple days ago, and they had to like I guess telecommute the whole thing. I think everyone's just having. <laughs> really weird experience during this time yeah yeah definitely <sighs> man I, I thought it was i thought it was hilarious though when onion ran an article because they had like mannequins at the taiwanese baseball game and so there was like a picture of like someone <laughs> hoisting the mannequin out and i was like this is like yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well I was, I was like i was talking to people in taiwan like one of my old roommate um uh, went back to taiwan during this whole, whole outbreak and i uh, we can talk about it a little bit later, but <laughs> she was talking about, um, she was talking, actually, I don't know, uh, uh, might, might not be able to talk, we can discuss about it, but there, she was talking about a story about how during the, so everyone's required to quarantine, right? So there's a guy who, who they, most of them, they track it through your phone, their geolocation, whatever. So one guy, he just left his phone at home and went to go get a yogurt from 7-Eleven. So he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> so he goes to get a yogurt. He comes back and there's cops at his door. Oh my god! They're like, like, where'd you go? He goes, like, I, sorry, like, I left. I went to go get yogurt, <laughs> and then they're like, did you do anything else? He was like, no, nah, like, just got the yogurt, and like, some question through some questioning or whatever. Um, he like he like I guess like they found out that he saw like a friend on the streets and then talked to him whatever, 
and then because of all this, he got fined like I think a hundred thousand MT or something like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> People are saying oh, it's like wow. it's the most expensive yogurt it was paid for. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's what, like three thousand dollars or something. So. Yeah, it's like three thousand dollars, three thousand dollars <laughs> right there. But oh, it does raise questions about like how do they know? But <laughs> right, I mean, maybe they were trying to like check in on him and he wasn't there or something. So yeah, that's what we hope. <laughs> right, I guess that's true. All right, I guess it's five o'clock. Should we wait a little bit longer? Or should we get started? Um. I guess we could, I don't know, how let's see, we can get started. All right. Yeah, so we can just get started now. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Yuan. I'm currently the culture chair for TAP SD. That's a Taiwanese American professional, San Diego. And um, just to give you a little info about, my, about myself, I received my PhD in bioinformatics uh, from UCSD, and I'm currently working as a bioinformatics scientist at Illumina uh, in San Diego. So with me today, um, I have Eric Tsai from of Taiwan. So Eric, uh, so TAP has recently done a number of joint events with of Taiwan, and Eric has helped to break down a lot of Taiwan, new, uh, Taiwan news and information about Taiwanese Americans. Um, for English-speaking audiences. So yeah, so Eric is here with me today. You want to say a few words? Hey everyone, um, Eric uh, uh, from of Taiwan. Um, organizations really just helping out people learn more about Taiwan from a English-speaking audience and hopefully break things down to more bite-sized and understandable pieces. So thanks for having us. Yeah, okay. So our topic today is understanding why, how Taiwan can help. So Taiwan can help, I don't know if you've seen it recently, but it's a trending hashtag about Taiwan's ability to help other countries with the COVID-19 pandemic. So this can be by sending supplies to other countries, can be by providing strategies for containment, or just like setting an example of how countries can better manage and mitigate the impact of COVID-19. So we're gonna talk in more detail about what Taiwan's policies were, why they were successful and the impact that they had on um, Taiwan being on the international stage and how it relates to the hashtag. So before we get started, I'll just uh, say a quick disclaimer. Neither of us are professional epidemiologists or public health experts. So what we're discussing and sharing today is just gonna be based off of uh, reputable research and articles that we've been able to find. And we just want to kind of um, have a platform to discuss it and talk about it and kind of like share what we found with you. So feel free to ask questions at any time. There's a link in the chat for uh, that you can click and ask questions. It can be anonymous or you can have your name on it. And we'll get to those questions um, from at different points um, in our talk. So also don't be afraid to have your own discussions in the chat. We're trying to promote discussion. So feel free to just like talk about it as we're talking in front of you as well. So um, yeah, with that, I guess we can dive right into the first question. So um, as we all know, there has been a range of restrictions and policies implemented by different countries all over the world. Some countries have done a, done a better job of containing coronavirus, whereas others have had a lot more trouble. So Eric, can you just tell me a little bit about how Taiwan has handled the COVID-19 uh, disease compared to other countries? Yeah, so um, as you can see from the charts, you know, um, throughout the times, COVID-19, uh, the cases in, obviously started in China in the Wuhan region, and they're spiked really early on. Uh, US is getting a lot more right now. And in comparison to say South Korea or Singapore, countries that are similar to Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's cases are uh, relatively low, as you can see from these, these data. And a large part of it really comes down to four different reasons, um, four major reasons as to why we're keeping it low. It's really a, a sense of early detection. Um, Taiwan health officials knew, uh, heard about this uh, towards at the end of 2019 um, from Wuhan region and kept an eye out for it. And with early detection, they were able to track a lot of information and start having different levels of travel restrictions to make sure no cases got into Taiwan, you know, as, as, you know, making sure that it stops at the immigration gates. Then it comes down to contact tracing, you know, with low number of, of cases, as the cases do pop up, 
there is a lot of contact tracing, which is essentially just looking at where this person who is in a confirmed case, where they've been, wh who they could potentially came in contact with. And then lastly, it's, you know, an overarching idea of just open information. Uh, Taiwan is, you know, has, is ranked as one of the most open in terms of media. And it's, you know, with its open information, whether digitally online or it's got health officials going on TV every day to have a de debriefing. Um, these four points really, really help Taiwan to kind of mitigate and you know, keep the numbers really low. Okay, so yeah, so it sounds like these are the four main reasons why Taiwan is able to do really well. So we have early detection, travel restrictions, contact tracing, and open information. Um, before we get any further, can we just go back to the previous slide and talk about the numbers a little bit more, just so that people like have a real idea of like what the difference is about like Taiwan versus other countries? So can we talk about like the scale here and like where Taiwan has been and is compared to other countries a little bit more? Yeah, so so this data is from like I think it's called like world uh, world world data. Um, I think um, all world and data. Uh, essentially, this is kind of tracking all the cases all around the world. So this this graph, you know. One thing to be noted is that you can see the log is a logarithmic graph. So instead of you know uh, regular increments, it's going with um, ten cases, the first bar, hundred cases, thousand cases, ten thousand, hundred thousand. So it's a logarithmic scene. Uh, as you can see here, like you know, uh, China's the orange one is the origin of it. Uh, U.S. is start has peaked now. Uh, I mean, hopefully peaked, but it's um, risen a lot through, uh, more recently. But with um, South Korea, there was a super transmitter who got a large number of rays. Singapore was doing a good job in keeping it down, but recently also had another, another surge as well too. You can see Taiwan here has been keeping it around like uh, 400, just, uh, just over 400, I think 429, I believe. Um, actually yesterday was another day where there was actually no new cases in Taiwan. Okay, so yeah, I guess with the plot, like it's important to pay attention to the logarithm scale. So even though it looks like, you know, Taiwan has risen a certain amount or whatnot, it's still around like the hundreds, like around like, what, 400 or 600 400 or something? 400, 400 yeah, something. 400. And then the other countries are like 10,000 for like South Korea and Singapore, 100,000 for China, or like 80,000, I guess. And then the US is like almost at a million now. So, um, <laughs> so that's a lot higher. Yep. So yeah, Taiwan's been able to do a really good job. And even it's really surprising, I guess, considering it's so close to China. So like it would be expected to have like a lot more cases, especially early on. So because that's one of the main things that we want to um, investigate a little bit more today. Yep. So I guess we'll move um, forward into um, the four different um, aspects. So the first one I think was the early detection. So can you tell me a little bit, a, a little bit more about what you mean by early detection here? Yeah, so um, early detection essentially, I think a lot of people when they talk about, um, so you know, this, this this virus has been going by a lot of names. You know, a lot of people call it coronavirus, but it's also more recently been talked about as COVID COVID nineteen. Um, I I don't know if um, many people know this. the the reason why it's COVID nineteen is first off there was no COVID one through eighteen. Uh, COVID nineteen is because it was developed in twenty nineteen. So this the first incident actually happened towards the end of December, and there was a Wuhan health official that realized this, and one was talking about essentially a new form of. SARS essentially that was you know happening in the Wuhan region and he was sharing it on kind of like a, his chat system but then it got like reposted more and more and it became you know he became a figure as almost like a, a whistleblower uh, this information essentially got out to the public and Taiwan also has been monitoring this and started making sure like you know in January 1st started saying like okay any any passengers that's coming from the Wuhan region has to get their temperature taken. At this point, you have to remember, at this point, no one really knew what kind of symptoms to look out for. So, you know, the only thing you can really hope for is like, okay, temperature. If someone has a fever, that means their, their body's probably combating something. And so they started doing that at a very, very early time. So there was definitely a kind of a early detection on right there. Right. And I think one of the points is that it's like it was a pneumonia. So there was like respiratory, they knew something about like respiratory symptoms, but they had no idea like the specifics or yeah. the differences yeah. in, uh, in the different symptoms. So what did Taiwan do um, from that point? Yeah. So, so, I mean, from that point, they really started looking at, you know, in terms of uh, simple travel restrictions. And as they knew more about it, they started, they started tracking this a lot more. So as you can see, like the, the cases that started coming in, depending on which region started getting them, um, they would actually start having different levels 
of restrictions around them. So originally it was, you know, just checking everyone's temperature. At a certain point, they were banning flights that were coming in from China. Um, as Japan got hit really hard, South Korea got hit really hard. These countries' flights that were coming in started rise, like started raising their restriction levels, whereas planes can't come in. As of right now, actually, there is a a ban on flights on um, uh, transit. Actually, so in the in the past, if you want to go from you know say like the states to Southeast Asia, a lot of the flights would actually fly to Taiwan first, and then you transfer to South Southeast Asia. Um, right now, the policy essentially is to to cut that off, and as a result of that, the, you can kind of see the diff the number of cases uh, compared to say Hong Kong or Singapore. Uh, the number of cases from travels and from uh, local cases um, has been has been redu uh, it's, it's, it's drastically different. So we can go to the slide um, on you know the confirmed cases across Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. You'll see that Taiwan Taiwan's cases most of them are coming from travel cases, uh, whereas like places like Hong Kong and Singapore, the number of local cases because some of these things got through because the the tra travel restrictions hasn't been monitored as heavily. It becomes you know more community spread uh, on local cases. Then, you know, starting after the after little, some of these simple ones, they're doing a lot of quarantine measures. So if today, if literally today, you got on a plane, tomorrow you arrived in Taiwan, you'd actually have to be put through a series of, you know, quarantine measures. This means like you have to register what phone you're going to be using, where you're going to be staying at, and you're getting your temperature taken. Then you're re required to stay at home for two weeks. This is the this is the amount of time that people assume, like, you know, if you have it, you'll show symptoms within the two weeks. And borrow cheese and everything, they will they will make calls to you, you know, make visits to you to make sure that you're okay. And you know, if you don't have a place to stay, they'll they can you have the option of setting up at like a quarantine hotel almost. Um, and then also like there's no random Ubers that you're getting. These are all like um, taxis or specific cabs that are meant for, you know, sanitation purposes that are, you know, like uh, wiped down every single time. And so these quarantine measures have been in, definitely in the more recent times being able to keep any local cases from really happening. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting. So it sounds like there's a few different points we're making. I guess I just wanna summarize what you're just saying. So the first part is about early detection. It's very important to kind of identify um, people who might have the virus beforehand. And so one of the key components to early detection is the travel restrictions. So starting early on, Taiwan started instigating travel restrictions from China and then from other um, countries as they became to have more cases like Italy and um, from like Iran. And then um, these travel restrictions help them to kind of um, make sure they keep track of all of the passengers that are arriving from these different places. Yep, yep. And I guess one of the key things to note is that like, it's not like they ban people from coming uh, from these countries, actually. They don't ban them. They actually enforce a quarantine on them. So it's like, if they're coming from these countries, then we have to instigate this quarantine pro procedure on you. So you have to kind of um, self-isolate for 14 days. We're going to track you in different ways, and we're going to have these different procedures. And then we started going into that a little bit more. But is that, yeah. is that pretty much correct for the first part? Yeah, yeah. So there are there are some countries though that are the flights are banned from coming in. So there's I, I believe there's three tiers of like the alert level for different countries. So as the cases, if it's not as bad, then obviously you can still come in. But we're like surprised. I think um, like for an example, the United States, you can still fly to Taiwan, except you know they are you know you have to go through the quarantine process. But if you're coming from you know in in the beginning when you're coming from China, the, it was too high. It was too high of a risk to do it. So they decided to just ban all the flights. So there are certain countries where there are flights that are banned. Certain airlines, um, I know for a fact, I think um, in China Airlines, I think from Taiwan is, you know, re reduced all, like removed all those flights from New York, for example. So there are obviously from a government point of view, but there's also individual airlines are also trying to track and try to lower the pos potential of being the reason why this thing is traveling um, into, into Taiwan. Okay, so there's like a difference in procedures depending on certain countries, the risk levels, and the airlines, and the yeah. location. Yeah. Okay, and then the next point I guess we're talking about is kind of the, the specific quarantine procedures. Can we go into that a little bit more or talk about these different things again? Yeah, so um, when, when you're coming in, you know, they're required to kind of register like which flight you're 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 on what's flight what seat number you're in you know just in case like this information is to kind of track if there is a confirmed case on your flight um you know counting trajectory and whatever like 
which people should be even alerted right away. Some people might be in a different cabin. I think I had a, I had a, a friend of a friend who was on a flight, there was a confirmed case on her flight. And wow. so because of that, they had to alert everyone on the flight, but she was in a different, she was in a, I think business class with a, with a person who was in an economy class. So they were like, okay, like I'm just letting you know, there was a case on your flight, but you know, you, you, hopefully you're okay. You're in a different, different area. She apparently used the, she actually used the economy class bathroom. So there was um, a slight worry there, uh, but it's kind of using yeah. this information to make sure like, you know, if anyone has it, obviously in the close proximity, there would be a lot higher alert for the ones just also just um, higher level of monitoring as well too. Then as these people, yeah. they have to fill out information about which, with, where their phone number is, um, where they're going to be staying at. And a lot of this is used to kind of kind of track the people. So you're supposed to stay home for 14 days or a quarantine hotel, whatever it may be. And, you know, they use this information. They actually set up like uh, geofencing to make sure like if, you're, if your body with your phone, because you can't go anywhere without your phone, um, <laughs> if you take your phone outside the region, they'll be alert and people will come, come over. And there will be also like um, borrow, I think they're considered like, uh, in Chinese, it's called um, Li Zang, which is essentially like a, a borough chief or a borough mayor, almost thing like that, where your small region, they'll actually come over. They'll make phone calls to you. They might come over. They actually give you they actually give you snack packs as well, too. So this is like, you know, um, it still feels pretty nice to stay at home. Some people are actually, if they're at kind of financial risk, there is, I think, a, a stipend of like, I think, I think a thousand NT a day, I think. I don't take my word for it. I, I think that's about it. The small stipend to kind of keep people, like if there are economic impacts, to their uh, through the to their livelihood as well too, and obviously with um, special um, special taxis or special cars, um, buses to take making sure that you're transporting in a in a safe measure too. You don't want to have, you know, take the plane and you're fine, and then you contract it on like the way back from the airport back home. So uh, a lot of these measures are taken. Yeah. Then, so I can. Sorry, yeah. with the first point you're making, I think it's just like, it's very important to know who else was on the same flight if you figure out that one person has a case. So it's just like, yeah, we should actually keep track of like, you know, specifically what are all the people on the flight at this time? And then if somebody else gets, uh, if one of those people get COVID-19, then you know that everyone else is at risk. So I yeah. guess that's like a bit important points for that um, checking before boarding. And yeah. then for the second thing, um, I think it's actually like really nice to, be given, you know, snack packs, having people check up on you, just like yeah. making sure that, like, you know, things are going well, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And, you know, you're actually getting kind of like room service you know, from the government. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, I think each, um, depending on which region you live in, you're staying, at, I think you kind of get different snack packs. Some people have been posting like, this is the quarantine snack pack that I got, you know, so you can look it up. Um, hopefully everyone gets like nice snacks. Um, I think some of the quarantine hotels, if you're staying at, you know, they also like provide you know room service and everything. They also make sure like any any like dishes or trash you need to take out. There's a special there's a special service person that comes over to take care of those as well too. Just because it could be you know kind of um contagious as well too. So there is a lot of measures that's being taken. Um, so despite you know the idea of like home quarantine for 14 days and you can't like forcibly can't leave, it mm -hmm. it sounds. Not so great, <laughs> but um, right. it's being implemented in Taiwan and everyone is kind of um, take, taken to that as well too. Right, okay, so you're like not allowed to leave, but do they actually stop you or is it just like honor system, like you're not, you like, don't leave? But... Well, it's 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 tracking your phone. So um, before before the stream started, we were actually talking. There was uh, there was a guy who you know thought I could outsmart the system. So he he was like, "Well, they're tracking my phone, so I don't need my phone. I'm just gonna leave my phone at home and I'm gonna go out and get a yogurt from 7-Eleven. And when he comes back, uh, there's cops at his door and so so he's like oh oh darn like and the cops were asking him like what he's doing and everything so he actually got a heavy fine um and okay. of course with this though this is you know there's a lot to do with technology but there's also the sense of people do sometimes ask be like oh is this a little bit too much technology are they tracking the citizens too much um i don't know how that specific case um happened but there's all likelihoods someone saw him outside or maybe even the borough chief saw, saw him outside and, you know, was able to report it. So um, this is definitely a level of trust between the people and his government uh, be able to attract these people as well, too. Right, right. I think it definitely relies on, like, some trust on behalf of, like, the citizens of the government and then, like, vice versa, the government of the citizens. Like, you kind of have to know that it's, like, a really serious crisis and that you kind of have to, like, play along just to make sure that everyone's safe, you know, for health reasons. So yeah, yeah, I think that yeah. makes sense. Yep. 
So I guess moving on to the screenings, the special taxis, is there anything else you want to talk about there? Um, yeah, and then like once, honestly, like once people come in, it becomes a, a big part, like even after the 14 day quarantine, there is a lot of social distancing that has happened. So, you know, Taiwan, unlike most of the countries in the world right now, because of its low cases, it's been able to still have life going on like usual. So there is still, you know, people can still go to restaurants, they can still go to schools and whatnot, but you can see a lot of um, public like people in public spaces practicing social distancing. There's like certain chairs that they're putting out and they put like a pot of plant in the middle so people can't have to sit a seat apart. There's like in restaurants, people are forced to sit in corners or, you know, putting up shields, you know, almost like you're taking a test, stuff like that. And so these measures, you know, are are there to ensure that they can still go out. You know, as as you know, right now um, in, in, in the States, for example, everyone is kind of encouraged to stay home. And restaurants thankfully like you know in the states uh, restaurants are forced to only do takeouts only um but you know in taiwan you're still able to eat at the restaurants but they're keeping these measures up in order to 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 create social distancing and making sure that um there is no spread even if you know especially because things this virus is asymptomatic and can be contagious while that happens yeah thanks i just want to make a point that we, we do see some of the questions that are coming in we're going to get to them in a little bit in a few minutes, but like, I think we're gonna first wrap up kind of what we're talking about here before we get to some of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a really important point here is that like, Taiwan is not closed down, right? It's like people are like, if you don't have, if you're not quarantined, if you're not just visiting, if you haven't just arrived, you're actually allowed to go out and go to restaurants and go to the market and go to different places. But they do have these different measures in place that are different than what like, you know, everyday life would be before any of this happened. So. Yep. I think one way we can think of it is like what Taiwan is doing is what the U.S. might look like once we open up. Like we might have all of these additional restrictions in place. And this is kind of like a good example to kind of um, get an idea for that, what that might be like. Right. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. OK. So I can think like the next point we want to talk about is um, the contact tracing. So what did Taiwan do with contact tracing? Yeah, so with contact tracing, really, it was, you know, any cases that came up. So, like, as you guys are seeing right now, this is a, a list of all the cases that came in. Um, this is, uh, I think, as of a certain day um, a little while ago. But these contacts are essentially individual cases that came in. You kind of kind of see, like, the, the age that they're at. They're, all the information is still private, though. We don't, we, we don't know who any of these people are. At most, there is a label up to, like, which part of Taiwan. They're northern Taiwan, central Taiwan, southern Taiwan. And so these parts are kind of... Um, listed out for people to know, but at the same time, they're able to track like where they've been and where if they've been to any places and everything. So all this is also done. I do want to do like a quick um, a shout out because in Taiwan, the, the reason they're able to do all this is really because in Taiwan, they actually set up the Central Epidemic Command Center. This was set up before, the, uh, during the SARS epidemic. They wanted to make sure there's a centralized area for them to kind of be able to talk about and, and do this investigation and to do all these things with epidemic control. And so with contact tracing, it was really just trying to figure out all this. And sometimes contact tracing is something that when the cases are low, you're able to do it. Um, there was one case where there is a, there was a ship called the, the, Diamond, the Diamond Princess. Um, it was a cruise ship and it docked in, in, tai, in Taiwan and people were able to come out and there were a lot of cases on the cruise ship itself. And something like this, it became really hard to kind of contact traces. There's so many people trying to figure out where they all went. Everything became really hard. So when cases like that happen, what they'd have to do, I remember I was actually in Taiwan when I, I actually got this line message, essentially a line message was sent out to everyone in Taiwan. I, I kind I, I think it's based off of like phone numbers in Taiwan. Um, and so it actually, it actually messaged me like, hey, let you guys know these are the places that the people from the Diamond Princess, like this is where they went to. So if you've been to these places in the past, you know, two or three weeks, please let us know, you know, and everything. So contact tracing is something, you know, they're doing to kind of hopefully to track down all these cases. I think there's still, there's a couple of cases that they weren't able to account for, uh, but for the majority of them, they're like, yep, I know like this is a, a, a a uh, foreign case, or this was like a spouse or like a family member. Um, I think the the scariest one might have been there was a a cab driver who actually got it, um, and you know she um, she you know they, like obviously with the cab driver is a little bit hard to track who all the people are. Uh, but this was a little bit while ago, so I think um, that has been kind of um, hopefully been locked down, and so I think things are a little bit better from there. Yeah, I think like, um, so what you're saying is that, so let's talk about contact tracing, I guess, first, like the definition is basically 
um, for all the people who have the, who, who get coronavirus, COVID-19, they basically figure out everybody that they've been in contact with and potentially been in contact with. So it's based yep. off of their close relations, the, the, their friends, and also the places they've been to, right? So it's like, those are like yep. the, the main thing. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Um, there was there was a case that was. Um, I was in Taiwan for for um for Lunar New Year, and it was there was a case that it was just like it was mind blown. Um, so during that time, there was already a high alert about you know people traveling in back from from China, especially from the Wuhan region. And you know this is you know this is Chinese New Year, this is Lunar New Year. A lot of people would come back from from China to Taiwan with their families and everything. So there's a guy um who came back. And he had he had some coughs and he had kind of a temperature. He took a lot of like you know like um, fever medicine to kind of drop his temperature down. Was able to get through it. Got back to Taiwan, and it turns out he went to like a club, like a like a dance club area. And the thing like this is this is not like this is not like um those you know modern day clubbing that you know you go like shot 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 and stuff like that. This is a little bit like you know for the older generation in Taiwan. There's like sometimes there are hostesses that will sit with you, drink with you, you know, and all that. And so. This person is back in Taiwan, and he's going to a club, and he's like, he's getting these hostess. The person who actually reported about this was actually the hostess. The hostess, a couple of days later, the the person calls the hostess and was like, "Hey, just letting you know, like, I have, I have, I have the virus. I, I have the coronavirus." And she was like, "Wait, what?" And so she reports it to the, the health administration, and you know, she her herself um got tested as well too. Thankfully, like she didn't she didn't get it. Um, and then because of that, the whole the whole dance club obviously got shut, kind of got shut down. Had to be um, sanitized and everything. But um, yeah, there's sometimes there are cases like that, and you know this is early on, and you know hopefully there hasn't been any cases since then. But um, <laughs> things like that does happen, and you know it's important to like if this person has it, be like where did he go? Where else did he go? And, you know, there's a lot of effort put in there. <laughs> yeah, that's really funny. I guess hopefully, like they're able to, like you know, tell everyone else in the club and like kind of <laughs> yeah. you know, get tested if possible and like follow yeah, up yeah. on that. But I think like that's one of the crucial things is just knowing how things get passed down because if you know if that phone call never happened from the from the uh, customer to the hostess, yeah. then nobody in the club would know that that yeah. was an issue and nothing yeah. would ever like it wouldn't be shut down and then a lot of people would get it and yeah, it would yeah. just continue. So that's one of the really crucial pieces, just like, you know, connecting the dots, like where did the uh, coronavirus spread through, where did it like come from, from, from this group of people, from that group of people. So yeah. I think yeah. that's like one of the key things that, that Taiwan has been doing a good job on mm -hmm. compared to mm -hmm. other places. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, going back to what you were talking about, the um, Central Epidemic Command Center, I think it was, the CECC. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that was set up in response to SARS, right? Can you talk about like how that that's been in place? Yeah, so um, SARS back in two thousand and three, it impacted it impacted Taiwan. There were I think uh, up to a hundred, I think seventy some up to a hundred deaths or so, and it was you know it impacted the entire island a lot. And so the the command, so they appointed the so after SARS happened, um, they were saying like. This kind of epidemic could happen again. We can't let it devastate the island. That 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 it can't it can't be that big of a problem again. We gotta set up uh, protective measures, and so they set up the CECC, which is the command center. And what has since it's been active, uh, the the commander in chief, uh, the commander for the command center has been uh, Chen Suzhong, and he he was actually also involved in helping things out during the SARS. And you know, even going back to SARS, um, Vice President uh, Chen Jianren in Taiwan, uh, he was actually the I, I think he he was also one of the lead doctors, epidemiologists who was in charge of SARS as well too. So there, the, to say that you know how Taiwan is uh, doing a lot of this, there's a lot like you know the the points that we've been talking about. A lot of it's actually just lessons that we've learned from SARS, and I think these are measures that you know, Taiwan has put in place to, in, in case things like this happen, you know, even in the, in the States, you know, there has been a lot of playbooks about like what happens when an epidemic hits, you know, there's been, I think there was a very funny, it was like, um, after coronavirus started hip happening in the States, I got a YouTube recommendation about a, a Bill Gates Ted talk. And he was talking about, you know, how the next, this time to be world war is going to be, it's going to be an epidemic or pandemic that, ha that hits. And you realize that the date was like years ago, um, but like, so these, these people have been talking about this, you know, and so the CCC was set up trying to create a playbook and, you know, kind of a procedure to, to keep it in check. And, you know, as you can see, Taiwan has been going by the plays and kind of keeping things in check. So lessons learned from SARS.
Right. I think it's definitely like, you know, learn from the his, learn from the past. You learn from things that have happened before and try to prevent them from happening again. So I think Taiwan actually like, you know, took that to heart and actually established something in relation to that. I think we had something like that in place in the U.S., but it's just like funding was cut for different reasons. And yeah, yeah we don't have to go into it too much, but it's just like people, I think the U.S. like officials are aware that these are threats, mm -hmm. but they just weren't set up properly in some ways to yeah. to have yeah. the same infrastructure in place that Taiwan did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of the also the key things about the you know the CECC and the other aspects is that they also integrated a lot of different kind of um, departments like governmental bodies in Taiwan. Yeah. So that like for example, there's um, connecting the travel the um, you know the travel agencies with the with the healthcare system so that mm -hmm. they can kind of like know whether people who have just arrived in Taiwan or who traveled recently um you know went to sensitive countries or countries at risk for uh, covid-19 and then uh, that information gets passed on to like the healthcare uh, workers or the hospitals um in case that they need to know that information in case they need to know like you know these patients have traveled do you know if that's that's the case or yeah, so there, there's been a lot of uh, departmental um, departmental cooperations between different, like having the information out there, and that's how they're able to piece a lot of these information uh, together as to you know who who's having it, you know all this. It's almost it goes, kind of leads to the fourth point that we're talking about is the data transparency, just letting all this information be out there, and you know there is you know a full tracking as to how many cases there are, how many people recover, how many we've tested, making sure that all the information is out there. At the same time, this information is also uh, the interdepartmental uh, cooperations as well too. Like you were saying, like the national uh, in Taiwan, there is a national um, national health insurance program that ninety nine percent. 99% of the citizens are enrolled in already. And so using information from here with other data, whether you know it's immigration data, as to like what countries they've been into, or any other departmental information to kind of track all this information down. I I, I honestly probably wouldn't be surprised if they had like more worked with uh, more corporations as well, too. You know, there is a potential of like, you know, um kind of Actually, I'm not going to say anything. I'm, I'm not, as a person I'm sure this is, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but this kind of leads to what we're talking about, kind of um, data openness. And so uh, as we're talking about the CECC, they actually hold, they hold like a daily briefing about like the cases, whether there's new cases today, um, anything to, to watch out for. So this kind of data openness has been very, very helpful. And this open, the data openness not also breaches beyond just you know um, in terms of government talking to people but it also allows for citizens to take actions on their own for example in the early times uh, the government was passing out was you know ramping up production on uh, surgical face masks and they're distributing to different pharmacies and eventually to convenience stores and they people were like i don't know where to go I, actually again personal story i was in taiwan and i was like I would go to like four or five different pharmacies trying to check for, hey, do you guys have face masks? And so they actually open up the information to kind of show the, to show like, oh, which pharmacies have it in stock, which ones are they receiving it? And people built off of the API to kind of make different apps and everything for you to track certain things. They have different formats, whether it's, you know, through a Google Maps or it's through, you know, a voice and whatever it may be. So that openness of information has been made possible largely because, you know, Taiwan, Taiwan has a lot of these systems and, you know, it's uh, the Ministry of Technology, the, the Ministry of Technology has actually been been very open and trying to get people to get show a lot more of this digital information. So there's definitely been kind of this, uh, um, Audrey Tang, who's the Minister of uh, uh, Minister of Technology, or Digital Technology, has been kind of talking about this uh, digital social innovation. And so it's been, it's been quite pivotal in making everyone not just be able to do what they need, be safe about the numbers. They know what the numbers are coming from. They know it's real. And at the same time, be able to have a peace of mind. You know, I can go find the face mask that I need to. I'm not going to lie. If 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 I had that for tracking toilet paper around me, I could find that a lot better. I'm just saying, like, that would have been really nice. You know, if, you know, if CVS is listening in, please release your data. I want to know <laughs> if there's still toilet paper at the CVS near me. <laughs> I'm sorry about the toilet paper because I started to run out. I was actually like getting down to my last few rolls of toilet paper because, you know, before all of this happened, I actually had a pretty good, like, you know, a huge pack. So I had enough. I was like, oh, I'll be fine. And then like, we start to go by and then I'm starting to like run out. And 
I was like, oh crap, I'm gonna need some soon. And then you know, still sold out in most places. So I started just like calling different grocery stores and it's, you had to wait for like automated messaging thing. Mm-hmm. I like um, went to different, I actually realized that like Target and Walmart, you can look online and they'll say if they have it in stock in different places. So that's something mm-hmm. that's like, you know, openness of information because it's online. It's actually very helpful <laughs> to have that. Now you just need someone to build an app so it'll just show up. It'll be alert. You'll be like, hey, just got restocked. Did your toilet paper here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then there's going to be a huge mass of people coming every time that happens too. Yeah. So, uh, a, a side, I think a side tip is what you do is you go to the CVS, whatever, and you talk to the people who work there and be like, hey, so, you know, when do you guys restock? And you just figure out what time they restock. And I'd say someone's get in before or the day before. So, because usually they get the restock, they have it in the back. They're just not putting it on the shelves yet. So, little tidbit, right. if you to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, you just have to know people that work there to get the inside information. Yeah. That's right. Anyways, uh, we're talking about information transparency and data openness. I think just like the more open the data is, the better for everybody in a lot of ways. You know, just like knowing about the number of cases that there are, new cases, where they happen, kind of like what you were saying, like, sometimes they're not able to track everybody because it's like a big club or like a church or something. And like, the only thing you can do is like, let everyone know, like, if you went to this church at this time, you should get yourself checked, you know, just in case. So mm-hmm. I think that's just like one of the major points is um, it helps the public to know things. And it's just like, it gives everyone also a better sense of security. Like they know what's going on. They don't, they're not as scared about what's happening and they okay. feel like they can rely on the government more that way. So I feel like that's, that's the key things here. And I think in some cases there are, there is like transparency in the U.S. in different ways, but like mm-hmm. it's not, maybe not as organized, not at the same level as in Taiwan. So maybe we'll yeah. talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I think this was the fourth point that we wanted to hit. So I think yeah. at this point, we're going to stop for a little bit. We're going to take some questions. We're going to answer some of the existing questions mm-hmm. and then we'll move on after we're, we're done with that. So um, there's this one question about the first question, I guess. So this is a lot of people talk about how the cases in the US are underreported. Um, do we know if that's also true in Taiwan too? Or is do you think we have a good idea of the cases in Taiwan? I think the cases in Taiwan is, I, I personally believe that everywhere there's gonna be, you're, you're gonna miss a lot of them, especially because um, coronavirus, you can be asymptomatic and still be able to, you're still contagious, you still contracted it. So there are, you know, pe- there are people who probably got it and never had problems with it, you know, and obviously those aren't reported. Um, in the US, there's been a large problem with an ability to test all the people. In Taiwan, mm-hmm. the testing has been, it's, they're doing, if you look at the, I think there's a couple reports, uh, news articles out there talking about how many tests um, per capita uh, there, there has been, but um, Taiwan's testing hasn't done that many. A large part is because they're saying like we've done a lot of um, blocking down any like foreign foreigners from coming in, the uh, foreign cases. So the testing has been more focused on the foreign stuff. If you haven't traveled anywhere like outside the country in Taiwan, the case the chance of getting tested is a little bit lower. I had a I had a friend of mine who was kind of showing symptoms. Um, and so he wanted to get tested and they were saying like, oh, well, you, you never travel. We don't have community spread. So you, you should be fine. Like, you know, we don't need to test you. Um, he was quite adamant about it and eventually got tested and the, the results came back as negative. But one of the things to remember is also these tests, even though you're getting tested once, doesn't necessarily mean the information is hundred percent correct. Um, I think they were saying like, you got to at least get tested two or three times to come back repeatedly negative for you to be really be in the clear that you don't, you don't have this. So I think in Taiwan, there is definitely still a case. I think anywhere in the world, there's a case of underreporting. Um, maybe I think the, the people who've done the best is probably South Korea. I think after the the, the hyper transmitter who, who kind of spread it out a lot, um, I think they essentially had a lockdown. They essentially had every single citizen, as many as possible to get every single person tested, regardless of whether they've been traveling or whatnot. And so this has been, you know, um, Taiwan is, again, like focusing a lot of their testing on the foreign cases. So whether there's underreporting in Taiwan, I think there probably are, um, but it's at the very least hasn't proven to be uh, problematic. There, you can still get tested if, if you're domestically, you haven't traveled or anything, but it's a little bit harder. So yeah, there there might still be some cases that have been underreported. Okay, so it's like for, for the most part, because Taiwan's doing a good job of contact tracing and kind of containment, mm-hmm. they're able to kind of determine out of all these people who are coming in, we know who has it and who doesn't, how to like stop them from spreading. 
out of the people who are already here, we're not really testing them and we don't really think we need to test them. And I guess like as long as there isn't any big outbreaks, you know, as long as it isn't like spreading to a lot of communities within Taiwan and we haven't really seen evidence of that, it's yeah. probably accurate that it's like, it's not a um, too serious in terms of the cases that like are not coming from outside of Taiwan, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, th I think it's, um, they're uh, focusing their efforts on and places, you know, where it yields the most. Obviously, Taiwan can test everyone, um, but, you know, that runs into the problem of, you know, not having enough tests especially in times when we need it. So, right. um, yeah, there's definitely that area. Right, okay. okay. Um, let's move on to the second question. So how do you think Americans would react to the same policies um, implemented in Taiwan? So it's kind of like these four different things you talked about, these, this quarantine, this um, uh, kind of like tracking people through their phones, how would, how do you think the U.S. would react to some of those things? Which are, um, yeah, which are likely that we could actually do? I think, I think one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, America is extremely diverse. There, you know, uh, its population is much larger than Taiwan. And there's, you know, diverse groups of people with different types of mentalities and everything. But there are, so I think one of the things like right now, as you can see, there are some cases that U.S. policies been kind of implementing that is kind of making sure everyone is following something that is not as, directly as restrictive as Taiwan, but you know, obviously things like stay at home orders, uh, these are policies that are similar to Taiwan, but not as hardly hard enforced. Um, you know, you have cops that are going on the streets to make sure there's no groups of people gathering. Uh, but at the same time, you see that in the past, uh, past week or so, there's been a lot of protests about, you know, people wanting to get away from these work from home, uh, these, these stay at home uh, orders. I think even though there are some people who don't want to and who would react very um, act strongly against some of the policies that are implemented, like the things that in Taiwan, but you know a lot of these people, these protests. I think one thing to keep in mind is that this is a lot of the media has been covering it, but there has been like polling that's been going around saying that seventy percent of the people still think that um, uh, America needs to do a stay at home, it, like it's too early to open up its businesses. So I think while People in in people in the states, you know, they might not act as it, it's it's a different level of of control from the government, and you know things like even like the data, for example, tracking your phone, just just knowing that like oh the the NSA could potentially ha like listen to my phone call, or whatever. We're like, hey, Facebook's looking at my thing. And people are very very sensitive about that in the states, and a large part comes with like whether there is a trust with the government or even some of these corporations. So when you're talking about like. Geo, like you know, targeting your phone, geofencing you so you don't leave your apartment. I think people would be very, very scared about that. I think there are even talks about people like, oh, these things are coming down. It's almost like a totalitarian rule and everything. So I think because of some of the things that um, a U.S. has gone through or Taiwan's gone through, uh, the people are more okay with it. Uh, whereas people in the states, um, because there's there's a huge psychological studies and everything. There's different podcasts talking about this, but you know, people in the states might not react as well. And there's also straight up also just some policies that the states are unable to implement that Taiwan has as well too. So um, I right. think it'd, it'd be interesting, but I think it, it, the the reactions would be very different. Right. I think there's a few different points you touched on there. So one thing is that like in terms of these like um, you know tracking your phone and all those things, I think. The U.S., I agree, like U.S. citizens would not be very comfortable with that because there's a lot of privacy concerns. A lot of people are very um, mistrustful of the government for various reasons. So it's probably not, it would not be a very popular policy <laughs> in the U.S. compared to in Taiwan. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of like, you know, some of the social distancing and lockdowns, actually like more severe in the U.S. than in Taiwan for a lot of these um policies or restrictions that are in place so for those it's like already even worse in the u.s but it's kind of because we have to you know it's kind of like yeah, we got yeah. to the point where it's the only thing we can do yeah it's, um, it's really because the states has just has so many domestic cases and there's so many deaths that it, it's a measure that has to be done um but like i said i i was walking back and i saw a farmer's market setting up so the problem with some of these things is that as it's being implemented if you're not seeing these things and you're not reminded of how how bad it could get after a week or two you start loosening up you'd be like oh maybe i don't have to wash my hands maybe i don't have to wear a face mask and you know so these are things that you know it really comes with the trust of the the government let's talk about open open the openness transparency of the government as well too having like the ccc would have a briefing 
every day, even if there's no cases today, they'll still have a briefing telling people about this. And this is a constant reminder that this thing is still out there. Everyone needs to, you know, keep its, you know, social distancing, whatever it may be. So um, this is, you know, it's a different level of uh, approach to its people at different stages too. Right. And I think openness of the government is really important. And also just like the, the population, the people also, you know, paying attention to the guidelines that are being released by the government or by the CDC or other sources and actually following up with these like social distancing measures or like, you know, wearing masks outside. I think mm -hmm. we actually are opening up farmers markets in San Diego also, but oh. they just like say it has to be social distance. It has to be like six mm -hmm. feet apart. Everyone mm -hmm. has to wear masks. There's all these additional restrictions in place. Yep. And I think like, people follow that and, you know, there aren't as many, there aren't that too many cases out of those people. It could be kind of similar to what's going on in Taiwan, in yep. which a lot of the time business as usual, except for um, social distancing measures on top of that to like prevent greater spread. Yeah. Um, are there any other things in terms of what the U.S. could implement that's in Taiwan that it hasn't yet? Um, I, th I think for, I mean, again, like we're talking about two, uh, two different countries at very different stages of this pandemic. I think for the most part, things like, you know, social distancing and all that has been, has been put in place. Um, there is, um, there, there is a little bit in terms of like, I, I think we've been seeing like, uh, when the coronavirus kind of breaking out, whatever there is like major crises that happen, sometimes there are people who who profit off of these news, or there are people who would, who would spread false information, or, you know, I don't know, sometimes it's just to get a bunch of likes and let their posts go viral, I don't know. But um, in Taiwan, for example, there's actually a, a, a new concept that the, the, the Minister of, of Digital Technology has been implementing. It's kind of like, they're calling it humor over rumor. And I think this is a, a unique way for for Taiwan to combat this idea of fake news and disinformation. So as you're seeing right here, this is uh, I think this is uh, the the dog CEO in Taiwan. So the, um, essentially, what they're saying is like this humor over rumor is so hey, we're gonna put up um, these 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 cute dog pictures, these kind of meme -y kind of pictures. How far should you keep apart from these people? If it's if you're indoors, it should be three dog lengths. If it's outdoors, it should be two dog lengths. Like things like this to make it really cute. And so because they recognize that when things are cute, meme -y, whatever, it gets people to spread it a little bit more, you know. Um, and then there's actually there's one case and there's a there's this is a pretty big disinformation that was sent around was uh, we're talking about toilet paper in Taiwan. There was a huge shortage of toilet paper as well too so um the 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 executive yuan premier uh susan's hang essentially he there was a meme and you're seeing this right now like this is a picture of him you know with turn around with his buttocks and a, a little like small shaking and in, in it's written in taiwanese it's essentially saying like you only have one butt guys you don't need to hog all the you know you don't need to hoard all the tissue paper and this was actually because there was disinformation out there that was talking about how oh the materials that's that's used to make tissue paper and toilet paper whatever it's the same material as face masks so as you as we make more face masks you're not going to get toilet paper and this is this is false information and um so the, the government was like we got to put a stop to this this actually they found out this was actually disinformation that was coming out from the toilet paper manufacturers and so this is, you know, this this way of, you know, this cute, this cute little picture is is a way for them to kind of combat combat this kind of disinformation. I think this is an example of something that the United States could be could be implementing to kind of to kind of help false information, being able to educate to put information out there first. But this still goes back to the difference of like there is a certain level of trust between the government and the people in Taiwan is a lot closer, um, probably because there's fewer people as well too. There's direct voting and all that, um, but this is kind of things that, you know, U.S. could implement as well, too. But everything else from like social distancing to, you know, no no eating in restaurants. I think this information, like U.S. has been taking these policies uh, very well as, um, as well. I think uh, there is one, another thing that I think was really interesting was uh, maybe this could be something that can be implemented when uh, businesses do start opening up um, is taking temperatures and having hand sanitization at the beginning of uh, opening up every restaurant or any public, like, you know, uh, businesses. I think I was in, I was in Taiwan. Uh, for the new new year's and i was meeting with a bunch of friends we're going to a bar and we're going to the bar and literally there's a line at the bar because we're trying to get in not because of checking ids not because of you know like bouncers like not letting us in quota whatever it is it was because he was like okay we got i gotta take your temperature okay now i gotta you know sanitize your hands you gotta make sure you're rubbing it you know cleaning it and you can go in one by one by one by one and that kind of policy though know, ensures that um it was, it was weird because i'm not gonna lie all the alcohol that's like you're know, rubbing your hands it smells like vodka so 
the bar is still, <laughs> still, still the kind of the same, <laughs> but it, it, it is, um, it is something that, you know, I, I'd be curious to see America, hopefully will implement something like this once, once the business open up as well too. So is something like that in place in like all the different restaurants or bars in Taiwan? Like, is that kind of enforced or is that just like a case by case, like a restaurant by restaurant thing? Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's government enforced, but it's definitely, it's not just bars and restaurants. This is going from like different, from temples to, to any, I think pretty much any single building that, that, that is out there. Um, you kind of have to do this uh, temperature and, you know, hand sanitizer as well too. And obviously all the hospitals are obviously um, implementing these as well. I don't think necessarily it is a, it is like a, I, actually, I, I'm not quite, I'm not sure if it's a government mandated thing, but it seems yeah. like, you know, Thomas people like they fall in line. Like if someone's do, if everyone's doing it, I'm going to do it too. You know, like you don't want to, you don't want to be that one restaurant or that one bar where it'd be like, yeah, we didn't do it, and yeah, there's like 50 cases because of my bar. You know, like so, um, I think people, um, yeah, people are following the rules. Okay, yeah, I think these like these different you know campaigns, these advertising campaigns, humor over rumor, they're like really hilarious, and I feel like we could do it. Like there's nothing stopping the government from from just like adding some entertainment value. So it's really funny because I think that we have a lot of things like this, but they're all like memes or like made up by random people. Yep, and yep. they're, you know, but sometimes they're accurate, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're just like spreading rumors. So I think if the government does it, at least you can rely on the information and it could also be entertaining. So. Yeah, yeah, so, so what they should really run is like, hey, there's the information I want to, the government wants to pass out. Hey, I want to hold a meme competition for people to post post it and then see which one comes out. I mean, names were invented in the States, so <laughs> should make it better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think another thing is just like, it's a little bit more difficult in the US just because it's so big and there are so many different levels of government and organization. So, you know, federal government, state government, local government. And I think it's just like, it's hard to know who is kind of the one supposed to, who's supposed to be doing these different policies. I think there might be some states that are like doing like a good job or they have like good, um government policies and like good education but like it's not uniform it's not like um it does it's not consistent from state to state so i think that's one of the things in which to improve upon is just having you know more regular or like consistent regulations and procedures all over the u.s maybe i think that would help yeah, yeah, yeah definitely Okay, so I guess we spent a while on that question. I guess there's also another question about um, tech surveillance. So uh, can you talk about how the tech surveillance will be monitored for um, after the crisis? So this is kind of speaking to in Taiwan when they're doing surveillance of, uh, of people with the cases and different things. Are you gonna be sure that they're, you know, they'll manage people's privacies properly and are they going to actually handle the data properly, I guess, afterwards? um that that's actually a really good question um i i actually don't know the answer to this um i will look more into it but i think you know a lot of this information obviously there is a fear of information being leaked out or there's information that is used for malpractice there mm -hmm. is concerns from taiwan as well too i think i, I think it'll be very interesting to see i i, I believe there is gonna i don't know if this necessarily uh, bodies or organizations, but there's going to be some sort of oversight. I'm quite sure. the The minister of digital technology, um, Audrey Tang, she actually she comes from a background of being a technologist, and she's very open on you know uh, crowdsourcing information. There's also a sense of monitoring the information. She she was one of the people who started this um, organization. It's called like uh, Gov Zero. Essentially, it is a book of they call it like um. Uh, civic hackathons. They, they essentially have these things to like, how do you use technology to help the civil services and everything and kind of a monitoring of the government. And she come, you know, she is also in touch with a lot of people in the civil movements in Taiwan as well too. So um, while I don't know the answer to this um, and I don't want to, you know, spread any false information as we were talking about earlier. Um, so, uh, but, I, you know, from her background, I think, I believe that there would be kind of a, an insurance that this information is kind of broken down. Um, but I, I will look into it. Um, Mina, thanks for the question. I'll try to look into it. Okay, is Audrey Chang, um, is, she Chang. said she was the, um, assigned to a position in the government or is she part of a separate organization? Uh, 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 Audrey, Audrey Tang, uh, she is the Minister of like, Digital Technology. So she is with the government. Um, she is helping with um, President Tsai and administration around that. Uh, but I think just from her background, um, um, like GovZero is an organization that's like separate. Um, so I think there is definitely some sort of um, monitoring, especially in, in Taiwan, there's definitely been a lot more 
good at government monitoring than there has been in the past. So um, I think uh, I'm, I believe that people in Taiwan would, would you know, make sure that these are, are taken down as well, too. But I'll look into it as, you know, pull some strings, see if I can get any information about it. Okay, great. Um, is there anything else you want to share in regards to like transparency and openness of information? Yeah. Um, so like openness of information, I think, um, I, I think it really comes down to the biggest part is it comes down to Taiwan's um, democratization. It's been, it's been helping there. There's been a lot of, there's been a lot of um, citizens helping out as well too. I think one of the one of the more heartfelt stories I kind of want to bring up. Um, I, I put a slide up there about these pink masks, and and like I think there's a story that kind of shows the people getting together to kind of help out. So there is like a hotline that you can call if you have any questions about the, the pandemic and whatnot. And there was a story about this 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 boy who was going to school, and he he called the hotline and was saying like, hey like. I'm going to be wearing a pink mask to school and these kids are bullying me, making fun of me. And, you know, what do I do? And in response to this, the next day's briefing, the command center, everyone who was on stage debriefing, they all wear pink masks. And essentially, you know, they, they tweeted out saying like, you know, um, it doesn't matter about the color of it. Like, you know, kind of like breaking down this kind of gender normative kind of stereotyping, whatever. And I think this is just an example, this is a little bit more lighthearted story of an example of how the people are coming together. And when you have this information that is open from the government in um, the people does reciprocate and be like, we're willing to give you information as well. because you're willing to open up your information. I want to give you my information so that, you know, it's in proper use as well too. So I think this is just as a story about how um, people are getting, you know, uh, Trust builds trust. That's that's really what it is. Yeah, I think that's a great story about just like solidarity and just like the government is also you know with the people and people with the government. Everyone's kind of working together to make this happen. You know, so yeah. that's a great story. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess we're at the end of like the second section. So we have uh, opportunity for more questions if you guys have any. I don't know if I see any more questions at the moment. So. Um, if we don't have any questions, then we can move on to the next part. Um, we only have a few more minutes left before the hour is up, but we'll probably be okay with staying a little bit longer. So we're open to like answering more questions and talking a little longer if you guys are down to stick around also. Yep. So I'll just hop into the next part. So this, this talk was mostly around the Taiwan can help hashtag, right? So we talked a lot about the policies in Taiwan and like what, are, what did Taiwan do to combat the coronavirus? We haven't really talked about too much about the hashtag and kind of the international tension that it's getting and the situation. So can you talk about like, where did this come from and why is this kind of a, a happening now? Yeah, so so the hashtag of you know, Taiwan can help, this is a hashtag that's been around for actually a good number of years. So a um, little bit about like the background of Taiwan. So Taiwan is not part of the United Nations, which means it is also not part of any affiliated organizations that's underneath of it, these a lot of international organizations, one of which is the World Health Organization, which holds the World Health Assembly, WHO, WHA. And because of this, Taiwan has been left out of the loop. And this is this is very, very apparent back in 2003 about the SARS. So there were information that Taiwan was not able to get because information had to go through Beijing, through China first before they could be released um, to Taiwan. And any information that Taiwan gets, they'd have to either relate it through Beijing or have to go through back channels to be able to surface this information. So um, since 2003, it's been kind of this, this sense of like Taiwan can help the world. Uh, and also sometimes Taiwan does need help as well too. In this case, I think you know, the, the, the hashtag of Taiwan can help becomes a lot bigger because um, in you know Taiwan's been handling it very well. And there was this kind of a this kind of um an example of what happened was, you know, this 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 virus has been on Taiwan's radar since December last year, January. And they sent an email to to WHO going like, "Hey, there's this pandemic that's, that's passing around. Uh, we've heard of some, you know, isolation ca like uh, cases where people have to be isolated. Um, can you give us give us more information?" This wasn't reciprocated from the WHO, and WHO were like, "Oh, you never informed us that there was people to human to human contact." And it's like, "No, we did tell you." And then becomes this. And uh, there's there's a lot of articles out there about like who's at fault. Was it WHO or did did Taiwan actually write the email properly and whatnot? People releasing stuff, but 
the bottom line is the fact that Taiwan is not part of the World Health Organization. So if they were, they could just very, very straightforwardly talk about this. And so this hashtag of Taiwan can help is born out of this idea. Um, and then there has been even more, more political back and forth. So recently, um, they rented out a full page ad in the New York Times talking about, you know, Taiwan can help. So this, the, the image that you're seeing right now is the ad that was ran on New York Times. And so this is, you know, a really a big grassroots, you know, people trying to push for Taiwan's, you know, admission into the, the World Health Organization, or at least at the very least is participation in the World Health Organization. Um, with There were a couple of years where Taiwan was allowed to to participate in the World Health Organization uh, Assembly as a um, as a observer status with an observer status, um, but once the new administration came in and you know China essentially said like, nope, you guys are not allowed anymore. So there's been a lot of um, political tension that's been around uh, around this hashtag, but ultimately now this hashtag has been really just been used to just talk about how Taiwan is able to help, not just you know they're doing it really well themselves and how they're helping with um, other countries as well. Okay, so just to clarify, so this ad was run, it was um, it was sent to New York Times from the government, right? The Taiwanese government? No, actually, this was actually crowdfunded. There was, um, there is a, there is a, it's a YouTuber um, uh, in Mandarin, is his channel called like Adi Ingwen. And essentially, it's it's a channel talk that teaches English. And but he has you know had a lot of like he's in the past had some like open letters and stuff like that. Um, and he like wants to like put a response out there, especially for the general public, you know, people like in the states and everything. Um, it has to be in English. So he kind of got this um crowdfunding that goes on, and everyone. If you ever try to rent out an ad in New York Times, it's very expensive. So, so essentially, he he puts on a crowdfunding, saying like, "Hey, everyone, like, I want to run this ad. We're going to have a group of people determine what's going to be on the ad and everything." And then people crowdfunded it, and within I think within a day or two, they they got it all fully funded. And you know, they you know, excess funds are used to going to be helped for these efforts, like for the pandemic efforts in general. Um, but you know, they they wanted to put put something out there to let people know that, you know, Taiwan can help and, you know, not just Taiwan can help, but the fact that Taiwan is helping. Right. Okay. That's great. Yeah. And I feel like, um, I guess the next question is kind of like, how has the response been to like, not just this ad, but the movement in general? Like I know like some countries have actually been mentioning Taiwan more just because of how well Taiwan has done with the handling the, the pandemic. So um, yeah, I guess what's been happening internationally. Yeah, so uh, with Taiwan's handling the the pandemic very well, they've been they've been reaching out and helping other countries as well too. So because of the pandemic, you need like a large surge of surgical masks. So Taiwan's been ramping up its production. Um, in the beginning, if like you know, there were a little bit of spat between some countries, and, like between Taiwan and some other countries in the very beginning, because. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, they were saying like we're not going to export any face masks because we have to make sure people in Taiwan have all have can protect themselves. Um, so some countries weren't the happiest about that, but you know after taking care of itself, they're like okay, we want to help everyone else. So now with its production ramping up, um, it's now sending a lot of these face masks overseas, and I think there is to this day I think 16 million face masks has been sent out to different different um, countries. Uh, some of these are also in exchange too. Some countries might have a little bit more of resources in certain areas. There's been kind of exchange as well too. So these um, protect these, you know, these protective equipment has been sent out to different countries. And a lot of countries are thinking, start, starting to thank Taiwan for doing this. And so um, these, a lot of the Taiwan's, Taiwan doesn't have an embassy in a lot of these countries because there's no formal diplomatic relations. So a lot of it's handled by a lot of the, the TECO, the Taipei Economic uh, Cultural Office, you know, handling these and working with different uh, governments, you know, whether it's local or federal wise, and try to get this information, uh, get get the people out. And, and I want to also say, like, this isn't just the government, like, um, here in Boston, actually, um, I, I know a group of Taiwanese people, they actually spend a lot of time just making cloth masks, because as we know, surgical masks are should be reserved for medical workers. But if you know, like police officers, they might not be in contact with patients all the time. But you want a kind of a basic um, protection. A lot of uh, people, Taiwanese people, have been getting together to make these cloth masks to uh, donate to to the police stations and so so forth. So this is you know more than just the Taiwanese government, but the 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 people all around the world has been trying to help out wherever possible too. Right. I think there is like a need for cloth masks too. Um, like I think even in San Diego, they started having, um, starting on May 1st, everyone who goes outside has to have masks or some kind of covering. And I think looking on like the CDC website, they also recommend like everyone wear cloth masks if they can. This is something that they, they started recommending like somewhat recently, but 
Um, but yeah, they, they're also recommending it now too. So yeah. I think that, yeah, that's important for everyone to have access to. Yeah. Um, so I guess like um, a kind of more difficult question might be like, what do you think would be the impact of this kind of movement and, you know, Taiwan providing supplies and just kind of, you know, having more attention internationally? What's the, what's the effect of this in the long run or like internationally speaking? Is there, is there anything that we can say might happen or is it just like, we don't really know? I, I think there is, um, in terms of formally, like I don't know necessarily what's going to formally happen. I don't necessarily think because of this, certain countries are going to be like, we're going to start recognizing Taiwan, we're going to let Taiwan into the United Nations and whatnot. But I think at the very least that what this this entire case has been showing is that like Taiwan is, it's, it's small and it's got you know not that many people, but it's also in the forefront of a lot of things. And there is uh, an international participation that's needed from Taiwan. And I think maybe not from a formal point of view, but this definitely shows people um, that, you know, putting Taiwan on the map, you know, you can probably, there's probably, uh, if you, I'm sure like if you ask people in like uh, European countries that might not know Taiwan or even United States, like different states, they might be like, I never knew Taiwan until this whole thing happened. And so the recognition, just like name brand wise, is definitely out there. And if you ask people, and as you know, because of this pandemic, people sometimes might learn more about it too. You know, what if there's any spat that goes on between WHO and Taiwan, they'd be like, oh, like, well, why isn't Taiwan in it? And there is definitely a better understanding. And not just with that, also because of because of this, even like you know, Taiwanese Americans are starting to be like, oh, this is like this is my my mom or my grandma or my my grandfather's homeland, you know, like, what are they doing? And, you know, there is definitely a sense of even uh, increase in pride about, you know, being Taiwanese or Taiwanese American. So I'd say, like, officially, there might not necessarily be any huge policy changes. It would be interesting to see if there was. But at the very least, from a more personal point of view, there is definitely a large, a large kind of um, higher level of visibility in Taiwan, and really just like, what Taiwan can do can offer as well, too. I think that's really great. And I hope that that is like, you know, what, what happens moving forward. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty much it for time and the questions. Um, we're open to answering more questions if you guys still have any, but I don't think we've seen any come in recently. So I guess, um, yeah, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to us. I hope it was informative. It gave you some insight into like how different differences in the policies of countries can have an effect on, you know, the spread of COVID-19 and the different um, resu results, I guess, reactions. So, um, yeah, you have anything to add to that, Eric? Um, yeah, I, I just, I think this has been, you know, a great opportunity to kind of just learn about, like, the Taiwan's been doing a lot. I think there is, there are aspects that Taiwan has done that, you know, U.S. can replicate. But at the same time, there are sometimes people talk about these things and be saying like, oh, there is, oh, it's so easy. If, if Taiwan can do it, why can't U.S. do it? And it really comes down to the fact that there's a lot of infrastructure that Taiwan has taken. You know, we mentioned about precautions that were set up after SARS. But even before that, you know, Taiwan has a universal health care system that has been up since 1995 with a 99% participation in it. And because of these systems that Taiwan's able to um, can monitor a lot of it. Not to say, obviously, you know, obviously to caveat all this is that Taiwan and America is very, very different, but it's definitely something that state by state could help, could learn from as well, too. So um, I think it's important to, and I also know that there is a lot of, because of Taiwan being international news, there is a lot of um, back and forth and some of these negative comments that go on between, you know, either pro-Taiwan or anti-Taiwan, whatever it may be. But I think it's important, you know, I'm glad that we have this hour or so to talk about this, is to learn a little bit more information as to things that are happening, as to why some of these things happen. And, you know, um, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you guys for, for listening in, too. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So, again, I'm Jeffrey Yuan from TAP SD. Uh, be on the lookout for more uh, virtual events from TAP, including these uh, mental health events that we're going to have. Um, the next one is Saturday, May 2nd at 11 a.m., and there'll be one the week after that on Saturday, May 9th. So, um, yeah, just be on the lookout for those. And thank you, and stay safe and healthy. All right, stay safe. See you guys there. Good night. Um.